good evening. Um, my name is Megan Phelps Roper, and I grew up, born and raised, in the Westboro Baptist Church in Topeka, Kansas. It's a congregation founded by my grandfather, Fred Phelps, and consisting almost entirely of my extended family. Um, my family is full of lawyers. They are incredibly intelligent and well-educated, you know, loving, wonderful people um, who also believe that the Bible is the infallible word of God and that Westboro has the only correct interpretation of it. What that led them to do was in 1991, when I was five years old, um, was to start protesting at a local park in Topeka, Kansas. We, um, we started just holding signs just about you know, the gay community, but pretty quickly, everyone outside the church became a target for our message. Everyone outside was a sinner who fell short of the glory of God, and uh, our job, our duty, our, the only way for us to show our love for our neighbor was to go out and warn them that they were all headed for hell and to explain to them exactly all the ways that they were sinners. Um, and, and that, for us, you know, the defini- like, as I said, the definition of love is how it was framed for me. There's a passage in the book of Leviticus, the first time, love thy neighbor, appears in the Bible, and it says, thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart, but thou shalt in any wise rebuke him, and not suffer his sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So for us, that, just be, that was a very clear indication that the way that you showed love uh, for other people was to explain to them why they were going to hell so that they would have an opportunity to repent if God would, would give them that gift. So that was one huge part of my, my life. My life and my family's lives were all organized around this picketing ministry, going out and standing on public sidewalks with, those, with picket signs. And, but then there was also this, you know, the very you know, loving home environment. I am the third of 11 children. Um, You know, we played video games and read books and watched movies um, and went to public school. Some people look at the fact that we went to public school and, you know, went to college and were educated and wonder how it's possible to believe in the things that we believed in the 21st century, even in spite of being exposed to every influence outside of outside of those beliefs that, that were, we were indoctrinated with from the time you know, we were children. And the only answer that I have is that you know, it's like being inoculated against outside ideas. Um, all of the years that I spent at Westboro, you know, any time that I had a, a thought or a feeling that went against Westboro's teaching, my instinct was to believe that the problem was with me, not with the beliefs, not with the loving parents and aunts and uncles and relatives um, who, were, who were surrounding me and, and explaining the goodness of those doctrines. And so, you know, with my grandfather being the, uh, the pastor of the church, you know, all the time that I was there, and my mom being the de facto spokesperson for most of my life. I grew up an extremely zealous believer. 10 years ago, uh, in 2009, I got on Twitter to spread that message to another audience. My goal there was just to propagate the message. I was not there looking to be changed. I just wanted to tell other people, explain, you know, we had the truth of God, and this is what the world needed, my grandfather would say, more than they needed air to breathe, water to drink, or food to eat. So that was my goal. What ended up happening, though, was that Twitter put me in conversation with people who kindly and respectfully challenged my positions. They found internal inconsistencies in Westboro's doctrines, and for me, that was the first thread uh, that began to unravel the rest of my belief in Westboro's doctrines. Twitter was really fascinating because there was a lot of people who responded exactly the same way that I had always encountered on the picket line, which was, you know, people would, you know, drive their cars at us, throw things at us, you know, yelling, screaming, shaming, a lot of, you know, very um, understandable um, responses given the, the kinds of things that we were preaching. 
God hates fags, thank God for dead soldiers, things like that. And when I got on Twitter, a lot of people responded similarly. But then there was this group of people who were willing to ask questions, who saw that I was a sincere human being who had been raised to believe the doctrines that I was spreading, and they had compassion. They showed me a kind of grace that completely changed the course of my life. Over time, you know, once, once that very first contradiction, internal inconsistency, was found by um, someone on Twitter, it was only a matter of time before, before the rest of it unraveled. And there came a moment when I, it finally occurred to me that we might be wrong that these doctrines I had been taught all my life um, might actually not be these divine principles. Um, I'm just going to read a, a really short part from, this, from my book describing this moment. This was July of 2012, and I was painting in the basement of a friend with my sister. And um, all of the do uh, doubts and questions um, were running through my mind. And this is, this is how, it, how, it, how it fell out. My arm continued to drag the paintbrush up and down, but my pulse and thoughts were racing. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. I couldn't believe how our love within the church had been warped beyond recognition by the elders' unscriptural will to punish, by their implacable demands for unquestioning obedience by their pernicious need for superiority and control. They had developed a toxic sense of certainty in their own righteousness, seizing for themselves the role of the ultimate arbiter of divine truth, and they now seemed willing to lay waste to anyone who disagreed with them. It was a heinous arrogance and sinfulness that could not be denied. And in a moment of horrifying clarity, I finally saw what had eluded me for so long. We had all been behaving in the exact same way toward outsiders. It was as if we were finally doing to ourselves what we had been doing to others for over 20 years. My eyes widened and my face flushed hot, overtaken by panic and shame and regret and humiliation. In the split second, it took my mind to find a way to make sense of the chaos that the church had become. What if we're wrong? What if this isn't the place led by God himself? What if we're just people? And I felt sure that it was all true. I crossed a chasm in that split second, pursuing a thought my mind had never truly imagined and now could never take back. With stark clarity, I understood that whether the church was wrong or right, I was a monster. If we were wrong, then I had spent every day of my life industriously sowing doom, discord, and rage to so many, not at the behest of God, but of my grandfather. I had wasted my life only to fill others with pain and misery. And if the church was right, then asking those questions and even beginning to consider their implications was an unforgivable betrayal of everyone I had ever loved and the ideals I dedicated my life to defending. In my mind, I was a betrayer already. I thought of my mother and the guilt was crippling. I didn't deserve to be party of this part of this body of believers. The Lord was done with me, and Esau, after all, already condemned. Overwhelmed by a sudden pressing need to leave that instant, Every part of my body hummed with a single vicious accusation. You don't belong. That moment came when I was almost 27 years old. Like I had been protesting for over two decades at that point. I had completely antagonized, I had spent my life antagonizing the world. And the one that I was now considering leaving um, was the one that had shown me love and grace and mercy. I spent the next four months discussing with my sister. Um, you know, I, I brought it to her the following day, this question of what if we're wrong? And we spent those months, those four months, trying to figure out what to do. Are they wrong? Are we wrong? Is Satan whispering in our ear? Is God testing us and we're failing? Uh, it, was a, it was a terrifying proposition going out into the world that we had done all these terrible things to, protesting funerals and celebrating the tragedies of others. Um, but eventually we came to the place where we knew that 
even if Westboro wasn't entirely wrong, that we could not continue to do the things that we had always done. We could not just continue to blindly follow what was being, what was being required of us. So seven years ago, on this day, I left with my sister, uh, left the church, and went out into the world thinking that we were going to have to hide for the rest of our lives, that there was no way that anyone was ever going to be willing to give us a second chance. And we realized pretty quickly that it's not, one, it's not possible. In the age of the internet, we had given all kinds of interviews, you know, news articles, you know, Louis Theroux made, um, has now made three documentaries about Westboro. Uh, and that was, our, our, our names meant God hates fags. And we knew that we had to do something to change that. And so we did. We were invited, there's a man named David Abbottball, who he was the one who found that very first internal inconsistency. And he invited us to come uh, speak at this Jewish cultural festival, the Jewlicious festival, that we had protested three years earlier. And that was the first time that we were you know, put in conversation with, these, with people after we left, um, trying to learn about the people that we had been taught to despise and then also to, to try to start looking for ways to make amends. For the last seven years, that has been um, a huge part of what has guided me and, and the steps that I've made in my life and the choices that I've made. David taught my sister and me about this concept in Judaism called tikkun olam, which means to repair the world. He said, you and your family have added to the brokenness in the world and you have a duty as much as you can to try to find a way to repair some of it. So we started working you know, with anti-bullying programs, civil rights groups, and law enforcement organizations dealing with questions of you know, hate crimes, de-radicalization, extremism, counterterrorism, all trying to fulfill that, that duty um, of tikkun olam. And so part of that has also, sorry, <laughs> part of that has also included attempting to reach out to my family at Westboro and to hopefully find ways of, of changing their hearts and minds. Um, there has been some success there, at least in helping them to moderate their positions. Um, but I'm really sorry. I, uh, I think I am going to stop here so we can discuss other things. Um, I just got off a plane a few hours ago, and it was a long flight, and I have my one-year-old daughter with me. So sorry for the abrupt ending, guys. But <laughs> Thank you. Megan, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I just wanted to start with the most famous action of the church is to picket soldiers' funerals during the Iraq War. Could you give us an idea of the specific rationale behind that action? Absolutely. So this is a question that came up. When I was 19, this is when we started protesting soldiers' funerals, um, my grandfather had been watching the news. He was seeing you know, these, the, these funerals playing out on, on the news, and he would say, these aren't funerals, these are patriotic pep rallies. Um, and what he said was, you know, I started asking, I asked my mom, you know, the first time uh, it was my turn to go to a funeral. I said, I need to understand what we're doing because I need to, I need to be able to explain this. She said, so we sat down as a family and she said, we start, we start going through these Bible passages. She started with this passage in Deuteronomy that says, where God is saying, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey me and a curse if you won't. Um, and she said, can we all agree that a, a dead child is a curse from God and not a blessing? She used the word child because so many of the soldiers that were dying were my age and younger, 18, 19 years old. And then she started going through these other passages. In the book of Hosea, um, God says, they have deeply corrupted themselves, therefore I will remember their iniquity and I will visit their sins. Though they bring up their children, yet will I bereave them that there shall not be a man left. And then in the book of Judges, God says, they chose new gods, then was war in their gates, 
So there was always you know, these, these Bible passages to explain all of the actions that we were taking. So it was our duty, my mother said, we were, had to go to these funerals to connect the dots between this nation's sins, that's the first dot, and their punishments, which is the second. It was the sinfulness. They would, Westboro would say that uh, America had institutionalized sin against God, starting with homosexuality, but including adultery and divorce and remarriage and fornication. All of these things were, you know, very clearly to Westboro, these are, these are sinful and God is visiting you for it. So that's, that's the justification of why you protest. But what was the goal when, when you got there? Were you trying to persuade? Were you just trying to get on the record saying this is, this is a punishment? We saw our duty only was to publish the message. How it lands, because Westboro believes in predestination. So how the message lands on the hearts of men was God's prerogative alone. Um, so that was, we were only trying to publish the message. Um, it was, you know, in some ways, you know, in hindsight, uh, there, there are absolutely passages in the Bible that should have changed the way that we spoke to outsiders. And this was, you know, this wasn't, um, it wasn't, when I was in it, this never, I never saw these, you know, the contradiction here. Um, you know, but there are passages like, uh, you know, Paul says, to the weak I became as weak that I might gain the weak. And that was the exact opposite of what we did. We went to the weak in their moments of grief and we sang literally sang and danced, you know, sang praises to the homemade bombs that were killing American soldiers. We, we played flag soccer, we spit on the flag. We, it, was, it was nothing like, to the weak I became as weak. Um, so we actively were doing things that just, just to be provocative, just for the sake of getting attention for the message. We thought, you know, if, if somebody here will see this message, you know, if God has mercy on them, then it doesn't matter how we say it, um, you know, we can't do anything to make this message palatable. So instead, we did everything that we could to make it unpalatable, in hindsight. Mm. So if, if, the, if the purpose behind the church is, you know, we're going to interpret scripture really strictly, why do you think they did ignore those passages that contradicted their actions? I don't think it was an act of ignoring. So I think about this sometimes, because when I look back at you know, because I, I describe these moments in the book where, you know, so for instance, um, I was reading with my grandfather. He had me reading aloud this passage from the book of Matthew. And he was specifically looking for, you know, this part about divorce. But pretty quickly we landed on a part where, you know, um, Jesus is saying, um, you know, bless them that persecute you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. And, you know, at that point, we were praying for people to die because of passages uh, in the Old Testament largely in the Old Testament. You know, David, King David, praying for his children, to, his enemies' children to be fatherless and for their wives to be widows. So we took this as an example for us. And, you know, when I got to that, that section, you know, with my grandfather, I kind of abruptly paused, and I was like, what does that mean? And he said, well, it doesn't say to pray for their good. And I, you know, immediately from the context, that absolutely is what it means, absolutely. He says, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, pray for them that, that despitefully use you and persecute you. And so that night I went to my father and, and said, like, what, what about this passage? And he said, well, what did Gramps say? And I told him, and he said, that's clearly not what that means. Um, clearly it does mean to pray for their good. And then it's, it's like as soon as the immediate contradiction was resolved in my thoughts, it just flitted away like a butterfly. It wasn't something that I, and when I, looked, when I look back, there, there's a few, few very small moments like that where some little bit of awareness started to like seep into my consciousness. And, and then it was just gone. And it wasn't until I actively got to that point, that, that painting in the basement moment, where it finally occurred to me that it wasn't just these few small points of doctrine. It was to, you know, to question the, the identity of the church as a, as a whole, as you know, being led by Jesus Christ himself. Mm. I think your contact with the outside world through your, your stewardship of the social media accounts for the church played a large part in your disenchantment. So why, how did you end up being the public face of the church on Twitter? It was just, I think, a matter of circumstance. So I graduated um, from college. I was 22. I was uh, still living at home, required to live at home. Um, I worked with my, very closely with my mother, and I had, you know, since I was, uh, you know, in, in early in my teens. And, you know, so we did a lot of things together. She <clears throat> just, she, 
she was in charge of a lot, a lot of the logistical work in the church, um, so the picket schedules, um, and just, just by virtue of the fact that she worked from home um, and was available a lot during the day, you know, she, she had taken over the, you know, the role of um, PIO, right, public information officer. She answered the phone calls. Anytime people were calling looking for an interview, you know, all the interviews with, you know, the um, journalists, documentary filmmakers, she arranged all of those things, and I worked very closely with her. So when I read this article about Twitter, it was, it was just like, oh, hey, this is a, we could use, we could use this. We could find a way of, um, of making something of this. And for, for quite a while, I ran almost everything that I wrote by her before I posted it, just to make sure that it was, it was right, right? Um, and so, I mean, I just, that it was just, just by, by circumstance. And how did that play into your disenchantment eventually? It was, it was hugely important. There, there, I started to say some of this. There, there were a lot of things about Twitter that, that helped me see outside of Westboro's ideology. Um, and, and it started first, I think, with a, a change in how I communicated with people. So first, the fact that there were only 140 characters at the time. Uh, there wasn't space for the kind of insults that we used. Um, just always, my mom, every time she mentioned George W. Bush, she would call him bombastic, blowhard, big mouth, bimbo, bastard, like every time. Like, and those, they, they, they did that, like all the time. That was the, just the way that they communicated. It goes back to that, like, well, if you know, God can get the message across no matter, no matter how you talk to people. And so that was, um, that was part of it. So I stopped, I stopped using those kind of insults, first because there wasn't space, and second because I realized that it almost immediately cut the conversation off from being about this profound theological point that I thought was so important to you know, being this kind of playground quarrel. Um, and so I stopped that. Um, it, it showed me sides of people that I never saw IRL, right, in real life. I, I, whenever I was in physical space with other people, even though I went to public school, like, I just, I never felt safe. And having this like, physical distance, this buffer between me and these other people, it made me open in a way that I never could be you know, in person with other people. Um, when when it, you know, it, it almost like, I, I was, I, I've been talking recently about this, I was talking to an anthropologist who said she defined shame as being uh, the feeling that we get when we know we have violated the norms of our community. So for, for most of my life, I, I had grown up in this culture that celebrated death and tragedy. And then I got on Twitter, and over time, because I started you know, making these you know, real connections with other people, um, they started to become an alternate form of community for me, the first you know, other form of community that I'd ever experienced. And when I was seeing their reactions when you know, mass shootings or you know, the death of a celebrity or some well-beloved person, you know, over time, that I started to, in other words, I felt kind of like, like, like I could feel the empathy that I would naturally have felt outside of a group like Westboro. So it kind of enabled me to f actually feel this. And then eventually that was what, I, n I never felt shame for what we did at Westboro until I got on Twitter. After I'd been on Twitter for a while and had been in conversation with with outsiders in a way that let me see their humanity. And how did that develop into actually leaving permanently? So eventually, it came to that that moment, painting in the basement. Like it was just this kind of pile of mounting doubts, and there came um, this moment where you know trying to resolve the contradiction between you know all of these things, like so these theological points, and then the way that church members were t were treating one another the way that they were, you know, lying about, you know, protests, like photoshopping themselves into pickets that they had, um, that they had not actually, you know, participated in, um, and trying to deceive people. Um, like, so how do you, um, you know, resolve this contradiction between these, these points, these um, doctrines and practices that, to my mind, were so clearly unscriptural, and, and then this belief in the infallibility of the Bible and in Westboro's interpretation of it? One of those had to give, and and in that moment, it was it was the latter. Um, the realization, you know, there came right after that realization. There was a moment, a very brief moment, where I thought, like, could I pretend and just keep doing this just so I could keep my family? And almost immediately, the answer was no, because 
And this was something that uh, David, who I mentioned a minute ago, um, the one, thing, one thing that he pointed out shortly after I left the church, he said, in a way, leaving Westboro Baptist Church was the most Westboro Baptist Church thing you could have done. He said, they were the ones who taught you to stand up for what you believe in, no matter what it cost you. They just never imagined you'd be standing up to them. And that was just a really, I mean, I, I talk about that moment a lot because it was such a profound moment for me, the realization that, you know, I could acknowledge that there was a lot of good in my upbringing while also being honest about what, you know, all the things that, that had gone wrong and why I eventually had to, to reject it. Do you have a sense of how they think and talk about you now? Yeah, I mean, shortly before, a few days before the book was published, they called me an antichrist. They generally try not to respond, you know, to, to um, ex-members. They try to pretend like we don't exist for the most part. The, the exception to that is generally when one of us says or does something that gets any kind of attention. And so in that case, they feel like, you know, it's almost, it's, it's an opportunity for them to kind of co-opt that moment and make it about their message. And this is why whenever I talk about Westboro's message, I also talk about all the reasons I think that it's wrong. Because I don't want people, I don't want to just, obviously I don't want to just defend them. But anyway, I'm getting off track a little bit. But, you know, they're, they have to demonize ex-members. You know, we are far worse than gays or Jews or anybody else that the church targets. Um, ex-members are the worst of the worst. And... I think that's, I mean, that's a very common tactic in, in groups like this um, because they don't want you to have any influence on the people who are, who are left because there is that you know, familial bond that in all the years that we spent together, all of those memories. Um, so they have to demonize us um, in order to maintain that um, their, their understanding of the church and themselves and who they are in the world. Another notable ex-member is Fred Phelps, who, who was in charge of the church for, for a time, but was voted out and excommunicated by the church. Can you describe the, those developments? Yeah, so about a year and a half after I left the church, uh, I got a phone call and found out that I have a, one of my younger brothers had left. And as soon as I, you know, I talked to him for a couple of minutes and I said, I asked him about my grandfather because I had been, you know, I, I pay attention to what the church does and I realized that my grandfather had not been um, giving sermons for several months and I, I just assumed that there was some health problem and there was, but he, what my brother said was that uh, my grandfather had been voted out of the church and that he was in hospice. I went and visited him in hospice um, and just beforehand, I spoke with my brother and kind of read through a whole bunch of you know, text messages on his phone, things that had happened while he was still there. And the short version is that my grandfather was voted out. Um, the day that he was voted out, it was after he had gone onto the front lawn of the church and had called out to the people who run the Equality House. It's an, uh, it's a, it, they painted, they bought a house across the street from Westboro and painted it rainbow colors. It's a kind of standing symbol um, in opposition to Westboro's message and in support of the LGBTQ community. And, and he called out to them and said, you're good people. And my brother said that, they had, that the church said that Grams had cast in his lot with the sodomites. And so, you know, I know that there, having visited him in hospice, I know that there were, he had had a, a deterioration in his physical health and in his mental health. Um, so I don't know, I can't tell you all of the details of, you know, how everything went down exactly. I can tell you that when I, w you know, when I walked into that room, I was afraid that he was going to, you know, kick me out immediately. That he would see my visit, you know, as, you know, me being an ex-member, um, as a hindrance. Like, did he want to rejoin the church? Was he trying to get back in? And, you know, instead he was extremely kind, and um, it was a really... It was a really wonderful, um, it was hard to see him so sick and to be treated so poorly by people who, who claimed to love him, um, by people that I dearly loved. But um, yeah, he, he died not, you know, and this is something that Westboro has tried really hard not to address anytime people ask them about it. Um, but last year there was a, a journalist with the BBC who, he was just extremely persistent, just would not let them off the hook. 
Um, and I think he eventually shamed one of my uncles, who's also one of the elders, into answering the question, and he said that he thinks Gramps is probably in hell. So it clearly, I mean, it, it is true. He definitely was voted out, um, and that's the reason, as best as I can tell you. We're going to open up to questions from the audience shortly, but just before that, what, what's really striking about the church in some of the documentaries about it is the really leading role that your mother Shirley took for a very long time, but that changed when a group of all-male elders took over ultimate responsibility for the church. Can you talk us through how the church changed in that way? Yeah, I mean, it was almost, I mean, I write about this in the book too, it was almost overnight, uh, and it was not something that was voted on or, or anything like that. It was not brought to the congregation as a question. Um, it was just, here, this is el the elders, this is a new office in the church, and these guys are taking over, and that's the end of it. And I think, you know, some people look at that in the, and the sidelining and shaming of my mother, and which was definitely a crucial part, I think, of my coming to the awareness that we were doing wrong. Um, but I think for me, it, the, the biggest issue was the idea that they were doing things that were unscriptural, right? Um, the photoshopping was, was one, you know, the, the total, like, you know, skipping over, you know, this is going to sound, you know, maybe a little bit, there are, you know, anytime anybody within the church like misbehaved, there was this like very set order of how things were supposed to, how things were supposed to happen. It was supposed to be brought to the church and there was a series of disciplinary steps basically. And they, it seemed like they were just, whatever they felt like doing, they, were, they would do it. It had little to do with what the Bible actually required. Um, so it was the fact that they, they took over uh, and then started doing things that were unscriptural that I, that I think was the, was the biggest problem for me. Um, yeah, so she, my mother had been, like I mentioned, that she, she did a lot of organizational work for the church. She, you know, I used to describe her as, you know, the hub in the middle of a wheel, like everything went through her. And, and that changed immediately after the elders took over. You know, she was um, shamed and isolated, like all of this work that she had been doing for decades at that point, um, you know, taken away from her as a punishment and their attempts to later reframe that and to pretend like they were relieving her burden. That was what one of the elders, uh, lying, said in, in an article later. And it, I remember reading that and just being just so incredibly frustrated because that was what, that was what they should have done. And what they instead did was, was treated her terribly. So anyway. Great, so we'll take some audience questions now. Just raise your hand uh, if I pick you. A microphone will come your way. Stand up when you have the microphone. We'll first go to the member in the purple over here. Hello, um, thanks for sharing. And in your speech, you mentioned a Jewish practice. I'm curious, have you converted to Judaism or do you still practice Christianity and what form does that look like today for you? I am not religious at all anymore. I, that was a, a process, you know, it started, definitely started at the church um, and then continued after I left. I started talking with people from all different kinds of belief systems and, you know, pretty quickly came to realize that, you know, there are so many different ways of viewing those texts and that there, there are legitimate alternative to, are alternative to Westboro's view um, of the Bible. Um, but I also immediately had this sense of, you know, having come from a place where I believed that we, I, that I could be absolutely certain that we had the right answer. The idea of, of like choosing something else with any kind of confidence, like I just, I did not feel like I could ever do that again. Um, and then also I just, you know, I came to this realization that or this belief, you know, that I, I, I started to see the Bible as another attempt, you know, human attempt to understand, you know, the world and the universe and our, our place in it, what it means to live a good life, and that I didn't have to accept the bad because of the good or reject the good because of the bad. So there's absolutely still, you know, ideal, ideals that I got from religion that still guide my life. You know, the epigraph of the book is this line from the Great Gatsby that says, reserving judgments is a matter of infinite hope. And for me, like that just represents the idea of grace, you know, of the ability to see other people as being on a spiritual, moral journey, and that there is possibility for people to, to grow and change and, and evolve and be better. Um, so 
yeah, that's, it's, I kind of get my religion from other books now, religion. Um, but it's just, I'm always open to, to hearing you know, other ideas and, and changing my views. So maybe doubt is my religion. Great. We'll have another question then. Uh, this one over here. Uh, Megan, thank you very much for uh, coming to speak to us. <clears throat> I was wondering if you could just zoom in a bit on that moment that you found out that Gramps had gone out onto the lawn and said those things. What was your immediate reaction to that? And also, um, to lighten things up a bit, have you got any funny Louis stories you want to share with us? <laughs> um, about my grandfather. Um, I... So my grandfather, when I was still at the church, after the elders took over, you know, Gramps was kind of sidelined too. Like they didn't tell him everything that was happening. Um, and, and so, you know, my grandfather would say, there was this passage, only by pride cometh contention. And he would, he would talk about that, that passage, encouraging humility and gentleness, right? And, and that was, kind of a change, you know, like he didn't really talk about that kind of stuff. And so I just, I looked, but I, I, I missed all of those things that happened after I left, of course. Like all I can do is, you know, hear these secondhand accounts. Again, of course, Westbrook completely, completely denies it. Like in, in this, you know, Louis third documentary, um, my mom completely denies it. She won't give any other, you know, information to, to explain why. Um, but so I don't know all of the, all the reasons. What it, what it made me feel more than anything though, was hopeful, you know, the idea that if even Gramps could come to see the, the wrongness of even some of Westboro's doctrines and practices, it just, it gave me hope that people can be reached. And obviously I don't want people to be reached like on their deathbed, like that's not a great time. But it makes me, it's also partly what, what is still so motivating to me to keep reaching out to my family. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind about Louis is this moment where um, we all went bowling. I don't know if you remember that from the first documentary. It's just like a very brief scene, um, partly because like we were we all wore matching shirts and Louis had to borrow my dad's, and uh, there was spaghetti sauce on it or something. And they're like, "We'll fix it in post." So th I think this is why there was only this very short, uh, very short um, bit about the bowling. Anyway, I don't know. There's. Uh, it was very weird also, and maybe surreal more than funny. We were on a flight um, from Kansas City to Chicago to um, protest a soldier's funeral. And so commonplace were, were those circumstances that you know I'm sitting next to Louis on the flight teaching him about the Hawaiian alphabet or something. And, and, and that, was, that was totally like, hey, this is a cool thing that's happening. <sighs> so maybe not so late, sorry. We'll have another question. Uh, how about just in the front row here, in the white jacket? Thank you very much for your talk. Um, over the past few years in Oxford, there's been a lot of discussion over the idea of no platforming. Um, this idea of, that we should not invite speakers who come from a, a hateful position to speak in places like this. Um, one of the arguments put forward in favour of this is that it provides a platform um, for these views to be challenged, but obviously this is a very different space to Twitter. Um, so I wondered if you had any insights into this debate. Thank you. I think no platforming, I think it's very important to consider context you know, and circumstance. So I don't know that you have to give, you know, for instance, Westboro a, a, a platform like this. I don't necessarily think that you, you have to do that in order to maintain, you know, good, you know, um, you know uh, gosh, marketplace of ideas, you know, civil discourse. You don't necessarily have to do it in, in something like this. I do think it is a mistake to try to kick them off of, you know, every potential um, outlet for their message. So social media, for instance. I remember I went, to, I went to Twitter for the first time, like Twitter's headquarters in 2016, and was talking with the woman who, and she's pulling up the emails that explaining to the, or the executive team why they weren't kicking me off the platform back then. If they had done that, I would not have had, you know, been exposed to these ideas in a way that I could hear them. So, you know, I think, but again, having a Twitter account and standing on a stage like this, 
those are different. Those are different circumstances. So I think you know each each group has to decide, you know, with each individual speaker. Like, do you believe that the value, like, are, in other words, are these ideas common enough that they need to be challenged in public spaces like this, or is it okay to ha to leave that to you know other platforms like Twitter, um, public sidewalks, you know, things like that. I think no platforming generally, like to, to completely try to exclude people from public conversation in every way, I think that's a really bad idea. And it's because you do several things. People come to bad ideas in all kinds of ways. You know, some people come to them like I did, talk to them by, you know, people they love from the time they're very young. Some people find them in books and in the annals of history. Um, and some people, you know, are recruited. You know, we need to have it at the, the language for why we have rejected certain ideas. Why do we see them as destructive? What ideas we think are better? That has to be part of the public conversation because it's not like we have all ever arrived anywhere. There's always people who are in the middle of wrestling with these questions. And so having that be, you know, part of the conversation, I think it is. And this is why, you know, David, I'm going to keep talking about David, uh, you know, he talked about you know, his reasoning for, he, did, he didn't think that he could ever really convince me to leave. He thought that it was important to publicly challenge those ideas so that anybody who was watching this conversation like would have, would have like the reasoning um, and the evidence for why, why Westboro's ideas were wrong. Um, and I think, I think that's, that's an important function of public conversation. And so, um, yeah, I think those are the, those are the broad strokes, I would say. Another question. Uh, shall we go over here in the yellow? Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Um, for I should say also, thank you all so much for your patience. Like that, that ending was like totally, I feel like I totally trailed off. I really appreciate that. I think it showed some authenticity, which is important <laughs> in the space, so thank you. Um, for those interested in doing good in the world and making the world a better place, there's a lot of discussion about trade-offs and where we spend our time. To what extent do you think there's value in challenging hate groups, challenging more radical people on the fringe, as opposed to spending time working on the more structural forms of oppression, the governments that decide the laws that govern the rights and the lives of the LGBTQ community, for instance? Oh, I, I, that's a really hard question. I think, I think there is... I can't give you a ratio, you know, of how, you know, one or the other. Sometimes big structural change comes from a groundswell of, you know, of, from individuals, right? From, you know, from the grassroots. And so I, I think there is a lot of value for both and that it takes all kinds. So, you know, I find, you know, a similar question. Well, I don't, I guess we don't need to, you know, veer off into that. But I think, I think it's all important. I think we shouldn't discount the power of reaching even one person. You know, I am one person. And because you never know like what that person will do. Will that person become somebody that can then make some kind of big structural change? You don't know. I think it's it's just important to see the the potential for change and to not kind of let hopelessness stop us from doing anything. It, or, and, and the magnitude of the job stop us from doing anything, from paralyzing us. Um, yeah. We should have time for one more question, and we'll go uh, right over here. Thanks again for coming to speak to us. Um, I think it'd be fair to say that in recent times, some of the inflammatory hate coming out of the church has been less intense than it had been in the past. Would you say that it's a dying institution now? Westboro specifically? Yeah. I think it's definitely moderating in some ways, and I think uh, I think it will continue to. I think there, are, you know, I've been making these arguments now, you know, for seven years, um, and I think that that has had some effect. I think that the the death of my grandfather and his influence as a, you know, he just was such a force. Um, I think, you know, without that kind of charismatic influence, that there is more room for softer voices. Um, and then, but the thing is. I don't know. I don't know what the trajectory of the church will be. I do think they will continue to moderate, but I don't. You know, I have a lot of younger people in the church. Usually, it's about one or two a year leave. Um, but there's a lot who are still there, and so I obviously I hope it will 
I hope more will leave. I hope that they will be able to be convinced. But um, in the meantime, I'm just going to keep, keep trying. So we'll be heading over to the Goodman Library now. Please join us. There'll be a book signing. But in the meantime, Megan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.